Hi, what's your name? My name is Robert Van Horn. Um, what year were you born? 1928. Have you always lived in North Baltimore? 56 years. We moved here from Whiteville, so I lived here 56 years. Why did you move to North Baltimore? Employment. I worked at the bank at East Dodge Ram, First National, over here, which is Mill Street right now. Okay. Um, what keeps you in North Baltimore? What keeps you in North Baltimore? Retirement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This, this is how I was born in North Baltimore way back when. And then we moved to the Whiteville area. But uh, So I've got roots in both communities, Whiteville and here. Where did you go to school? Jackson Township at Whiteville, all 12 years there. And then I went to Tiffin University after that for a couple of years. What kind of trends were popular when you were younger? Trends? Trends. Like, what trends did you do? Oh, yeah. okay. Uh, I had to think about that a little bit. Butch haircuts was popular then, you know, because it went from the, the grease down hair into the young fellows decided they didn't want that. And uh, so they switched to, we called them butch haircuts. I think they might be called crew cuts and they have other names now, but it's really not much hair on top of your head, what it is. And, uh, okay. What kind of things did you do for fun when you were young? You know, I, I started to jot that down, and I, I came up with a whole heck of a list, so I hope you don't mind, but uh, growing up in a small town, and at the time, we were just coming out of the Depression, and so a lot of the things is homemade. What you do, you had to do was homemade. And so I, we played uh, a game called Round Town. And what that was, it's about like, well, it was if whatever kind of ball you had available. He usually took a number of kids and whatever in a small town. Everybody knew everybody and they all played together. And round town is where where you came, like you know the numbers on the ball fields now, the, the pitcher, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, well that's the same way we played that. You came out when you first came into the game, you started at the top number. And as the batter came up to bat, if you would catch the ball he hit, then you swapped. But if you just got him out on a ground ball or some other way, or then you moved up a notch from nine to eight, so you finally got around, you played all the positions, and you finally got the bat <laughs> sooner, sooner or later. And uh, so the balls, again, uh, I keep saying depression because a lot of this stuff was made up that you didn't couldn't go to a store. It wasn't stored to get it anyhow. If it was, you couldn't afford it. <laughs> so, so you had a lot of homemade stuff. And one of the balls we used quite frequently would take an old sock that couldn't be darned anymore because mothers did those darning to repair the sock. And then you stuff some other old rags into that as tight as you could, tied it all with a string, and I got them all. And a bat, whatever you could come up with. Uh, you just sell them at a regular bat. Or you know, a broomstick handle that was cut down or something out of wood that could be used as a bat. Work fine, they had a lot of fun. That was we called that round town. We made kites in this kind of weather here. And you would go to the grocery store and if they were willing, you would by then each grocery store had their own meat market, uh, you know, to sell bulk meat, like none, none of it was prepackaged, it was all in display. And if you ordered something or other, well, then they put it in a oh, little plastic, well, cardboard and container of whatever weight you wanted. They had scales weighed out, and they had a big old roll of wrapping paper. They pull that out, tear it off, and wrap up your meat with And you would try, and they quite often would allow them to do that. You'd ask for enough to make a kite out of that wrapping paper. And then you'd go home, and you were you had to be sort of inventive because no money, no money in that. And allowance then was what they tolerated. It wasn't any money you got; it's just what the parents tolerated. So that's what allowance meant then. What they let you get away with. <laughs> <laughs> and so you made your own. You were able to come up with strips. You made it like a cross. 
for the kite frame, and then you would mark the paper so that you could overlap it just over the string that you had around the frame. And how did you stick it fast? Took some of mom's flour and some water, and made a paste, and slowly put that on the kite frame and seal it, patiently waited for it to come up. And then I don't remember where we got the string because we would fly, but we was able to, and you kept that, but you couldn't get a lot of that either. But then you would tie that, make a little hole in the paper where the pieces of wood crossed. That's where you tied your tight string. Now what did you use for tail? Some more rags and stuff like that there. And you'd unwind her maybe from here to the wall in the other room there. Two of you preferably. And one guy would be on the kite and you'd be on the string. You'd back up, try to catch a little bit of wind. <laughs> try, try to get, if you get up there, fine. You had a lot of fun with it. But quite often you had accidents with them and you had to redo them, but you did. because that was So that was kite making. Uh, in the, during the late afternoon, you spent a lot of time outside. There was, the only time you really spent inside was when the weather was bad. And then what did you do inside? Uh, you read a lot. We did a lot of reading there. And comic books were just coming out then, and uh, 10 cents a piece. And uh, of course, it's hard to come up with 10 cents. But one of my good friends, uh, at the time, a boy a year older than I, boy, he was able to work to get a few pennies, as I was, and so we knew which comic books to buy. We never bought the same comic book, but when we went to town before to buy it, we had the conversation. You buy Superman or whoever it was at the time, and I'd buy another, and we'd swap back and forth so we could read them. Another book we let out was called Big Little Book. And I don't see them anymore, but it was really mostly novels about dogs or whatever kids of our age would have of interest. And the books were, oh, at least an inch thick. And they were about the size of your hand. Were, that's why they were called big little books, <laughs> because of the shape of them. And you would, uh, you, those you kept and traded back and forth. And, you know, what else did we do? played hide and seek, which is still popular, I guess. And we played kick the cat. Did you ever play kick the cat? Back in, well, back in those days, about the only cans you had was uh, uh, milk, not the, uh, dang it's not evaporated milk, obviously. <laughs> but it was condensed milk, condensed milk, that's what it was. So you had those, that was about the only thing that was in metal cans at that time. And so when, Mom would end up with a can like that, well then that's what you used to kick the can. It was sort of like hide and seek because whoever was it had the can set there and you kick it. And the rest of the people was in there, they run, run, run. And the idea of the game was they would try to get back and kick the can because you went and picked it up and set it back. The idea was for them to come and kick the can before you could race them back and say you're out. <laughs> <laughs> And so, I mean, very simple, basic games, but oh man, we did a lot of running and a lot of sweating with those old on games. And like I said, we uh, did a lot of reading and the weather so far. We spent most of the time outside. The parents just didn't want to well, That's the way it was done, get outside. <laughs> so in our house, we had a, 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 a rather large family. There was a, eight of us in the beginning, but the baby died when I was four, so after that there were seven of us that grew up. In our house in Whiteville, then we had a big dining room table that would open up and you could put three leaves in it. And we had a ping pong set there. And so our house was a popular spot to play ping pong. And we, and, and it, was, it was probably about this wide, maybe a little wider, but it didn't matter because we played on a lot of ping pong in that doggone room there. And models, we did as when you got alone and just decided to be alone, you went to your own bedroom usually, and which wasn't yours, you shared it with other members <laughs> of the family. 
but you usually had a little corner to sort of yours. And uh, we made model, at that time it was quite model airplanes. I can remember with balsa wood, you know, they were kits and they came and you pre-assembled with the glue wood, got them all together and put them on this, not wax paper, it was just it was a very thin paper that would, you get them, you get the uh, airplane covered with this and then you'd seal it a little bit and your decision, do I fly this or do I just keep this? Because you knew if you flew it and it didn't fly, <laughs> it, it, was, it, it broke pretty easily. And you spent all that time putting it together. You didn't want, you want to do that or not. So some you did, some you didn't. So that was the models. Did a lot of biking. We had uh, most of the time each one of the kids had a hand-me-down bicycle bike. I never did get a new bike. <laughs> it was all, it was all, but it was workable, quite all right. So we had to, did a lot of biking. We did some tire rolling. You know, you take a tire, just roll it, compete with each other, and get lined up, and go, and then you see who could roll their tires the fastest or whatever, and stop and give it, <laughs> uh, you know, the end of the goal was. Slingshots, we had a lot of slingshots with uh, two different types. You could cut a Y out of a tree about the size of your finger, and then you'd put rubber bands around the top and bring the rubber bands back, and you would tie the end of the rubber band to a, what ended up to be the slingshot, which was usually a tongue out of an old pair of shoes that no longer looked. You used a lot of leftover stuff, that's what you had to work with. Uh, the other one was just a plain straight rubber band. Where are you getting these rubbers? In those days, they had uh, inner tubes that went to the tires, and when they got so many holes in them, why? Then the kids got to convert the inner tubes into rubber things. And so the other type, you still had the same uh, carrier for the stone, but on one end of it, you'd tie the string to the slot, and then you'd stretch your rubber band over your thumb far enough away so when you turned it loose, it missed your thumb, you know. <laughs> and that was the other type of slingshots that you had. Every boy had one of those in his pocket. <laughs> he just gives one of those things. Because you see any stone that looked like that's about the right size. If you didn't need one, just pick it up and see how far you could throw it, you know. And, uh, but probably the one that we had the most fun with at that time, uh, we are not in high school yet, but we're probably in the seventh, eighth grade. And we made rubber, rubber guts. And this was, you took a piece of wood about four inches wide and about six or seven inches long. And then you would, cut out a design of wood. You leave the top part, ended up being the barrel, and you can go back so far and cut down and then cut on the way over. Now that part was also part of a gun because that was part of your grip. And you take those strips of rubber inner tube that you cut out, they become, they would stretch from the top of the barrel you know, they'd stretch them underneath. Now, back to the handle. And what you used as a trigger was a clothespin, not the kind of a, well, the old style of clothespin, you know, it sits down. And you'd snap them apart without mother's approval, which you did. And then you'd take another little piece of wood to put against the back part of your handle here. That would be the fulcrum the middle part, and then the rubber bands would come around and hold that all in place. So when you squeezed your hand on that uh, gold spin, and that opened up the top. So your bullet was also made of rubber bands. You usually had those tight knots because they're not going to go further. And you'd stretch that from the top of the barrel back to put the back into the, where your handle was hold it there. 
and then you competed. And like I say, we're probably in our seventh, eighth grade now. And most of all, I never know just the race boys. And you choose up sides. If you hit the opponent's head, you're done. But any other part of the body is fair game. So if you could hit the other guy with your rubber gun, and they, they would stretch over easily from here to the door. And uh, if you could hit your opponent first, you won. Any part of the body counted, yours included. <laughs> so, so if you missed and he hasn't shot his yet, you take off. <laughs> so, and you had buildings to run around, run around. So you're trying to work around so you can get back around so you can pick up your bullet again, you know, before he gets you shot. Sometimes you could, more often you couldn't, but that's the way the game's played. And then if you could find your bullet again before you got in, and you try to hide long enough so you can load up and get it off. Oh, you play hours with that. It just, it just, so you got a lot of exercise. You, you went home sweaty, I mean, because that, sometimes you got in arguments, but more often than not, you just played fairly. But th that was very popular. And then Barnville in the winter. There's a couple small barns in town in Whiteville. And the East Belt wasn't used for farming anymore. And, uh, the landowner, one of the boys' dads and moms at that barn, had a cow, but that was the only livestock in the barn. So the upper part of the barn, you know, the roof part here, your granddad would know all about this. And then they, we hung baskets on each end of that. And so it was rough flooring, but it was still in out of the weather. And we would play barn ball then. Sometimes it's so cold up there you wore gloves, <laughs> but, you, but you still played and you could. What did we use for baskets? Uh, hampers, tomato hampers. It used to be all wood ones. You knock the bottom out of that, nail it up on the wall, and that was your basket. Uh, pretty rinky dinky, but it served a purpose for the boys. And so a lot of a lot of tomato baskets went up over town over the years to what the bottom knocked out of it. And we never had a real size basketball school or somehow I've got one about the size of a soccer ball. It's just smaller than a basketball but bigger than a softball. And uh, so it's, but we played a lot of ball like that. And so we like running and tagging and those those are well, those were good games, and so I'm surprised that I had all but we did. So that takes care of what we did for fun. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what kind of stories were you told as a child? You know, it was mostly, I was thinking about that one. I had to think a while. It was mostly family stories on what your dad had done when he was a kid, what they did for fun or a favorite uncle that no longer was around, but you knew where he was at. Uh, you like to hear stories about him. And one of my favorite uncles, he never married. Uh, he was in World War I. He came home, still didn't marry. Went to work on the railroad in the express train, not on a working gang, but in the express train. He ended up back in service in World War II. He was that age where when time went on when he went into service in World War II I'm like. And I like to hear stories about him. And then my brothers, of the seven of us that grew up, there were Francis, Henri, Bernice, Helen, Mildred, Carl, Bob. That's the seven of us. And two older when Francis and Henri, uh, before the war, went into 3C camp. I bet some of your uncles or great uncles would have been familiar with that. Civilian Conservation Corps. That was a government program where they took these young fellows and usually sort of semi-military is what it amounted to. Because they would take them out west and they would cut trees, they would build dams, they'd do anything quite physical. And they got paid a few cents for it, but that took them away from eating at home at a table at home. And it, 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 time, time, times were pretty rough then, but that's what you did. So, But uh, 
so I like to hear stories about when they was in the three C's and then when my Uncle Clyde was in service. Uncle Clyde then ended up in Chicago in retirement, work at the uh, uh, museum, I forget the name of it, in Chicago. But one of the things they had there was a small German submarine and that was one of his responsibilities to be a, a guide through that German submarine. Well, he had fascinating tales to tell. Never married, but uh, just a favorite uncle because of tales he had available he lived through. And so, what else are we talking about there? Um, is it true that you were in the service? Mm -hmm. Is it true that you were in the service? Yeah, I was. What war? Well, as I graduated in 46 at 17, and I enlisted in October, graduated in May, enlisted in October. In between time, I had my birthday in July, so I became 18, and I enlisted in uh, the service in 46, and so the solo combat. Uh, but I was in Japan for most of my time, and uh, so it, uh, it, it was a, it was a good experience, but uh, different. But uh, the reason why I enlisted was twofold. I wanted some further education, and the government had a beautiful GI Bill of Rights, that, which education was part of it. And being the blue collar family that we were, I know there was no funds laid aside for Bob to go to college. And so I, to me, I said, well, my option was to enlist, which would qualify me for GI Bill then. So I thought so that I was in service. So, they later on officially declared World War II, which was over in 45. They made the official closing date of December of 46. So technically, I'm a veteran of World War II. But again, there was some combat. Uh, so that's one of the questions at the bottom there. Have you traveled out of the country? Yeah, courtesy of all <laughs> Sam. <laughs> yeah. so, Okay. Uh, what are some past occupations that you've been in? Two. I had two careers, really. Uh, one of them was banking, starting here in North Baltimore. Uh, I was a banker for 34 years, and then I was a Wood County treasurer for another 12. And uh, so that made 46 years, and uh, I figured it was time to hang it up. I hated to get up in the morning. Are you guys early sleepers or late sleepers or how are you? I wake up pretty early. Are you? Yeah. How do you do that? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, well, that was, it wasn't a formal final decision on when to retire, but after 46 years, that was part of my decision. I didn't have to get up at no 7, 7.30 every morning <laughs> to go to work. And, uh, and I don't know. I, I got an alarm that wakes me at 8 o'clock in the morning so I can call my son in Columbus. We, we communicate every day. I call him every day. so he can, I don't want that phone call. <laughs> okay, what else you got? What major historical events have you looked at? Oh, yeah. <coughs> I jotted the doors down to probably the World War II. I lived through that, obviously, as first as a young guy. <coughs> and then sort of the tail end in the Army of Occupation. Lived through the Depression as a child and was around for the moon landing when that happened. And the, and the one that I almost forgot <coughs> was uh, at a bomb in Japan. Because that happened in the late 40s. You'll get mixed opinions on that from different people and those who were World War II was so was still winding down, and it wasn't over yet. But the atomic bombs finished World War II, and he, I was of the class. I was glad to see it. it. Sounds cold, but I was also at an age. If the war hadn't ended, then I definitely would have been part of the tail end of the war. I, no, if you got a choice, you're not going to go. If you have to, you will. But uh, by choice, you probably, very few might, but the majority of 
young men chose not to. That's why when Vietnam came around, there were several hard-charging good young men who went to Canada or went to an education that would keep them out of it. So unless you're personally faced with that decision, you can't really tell somebody else what they ought to do. That's, they'll do what they desire to as you did. But, so yeah, uh, went through that. What else did we see? Uh, moon landing, World War II, depression. Depression, I gotta go back to that, but that's where I started. And, uh, there's so much. One of the favorite expressions was in, you make do or you do without. There wasn't any food banks or anything of this nature then, there just wasn't. And during World War II then, you went through rationing. And again, you actually had a coupon book that was given you by probably the county, maybe the state. I don't know how we got position of Every family had it. And coupons had restricted things that you could buy by using that coupon book. I remember because mom was in charge of it. Most of us eating related, but not all. The sugar, I remember that was on there. And flour, I remember that was on there. And gasoline was restricted because of the war at the time. Uh, gasoline was 20 cents a gallon. <laughs> yeah. You didn't see changes popping around. It was 20 cents a gallon. But you had to be able qualify in order to get it. Doctors were exempted and I tried, doctors in those days made house calls. They actually had that little black bag and they would come. To, so when babies were born at home most of the time, I was too, and then I wasn't one. Uh, so it, it was a harder time, but you lived through it because no one it wasn't just you, it was practically everybody in the community was in the same boat as you were. I, I remember the food stuff. You didn't have a selection of things that you wished to eat. You ate what mom was able to put on the table. You'd always have a hot something and beans and potatoes was a staple of the time. And it uh, You never ate until Dad come home for their supper meal. So Mom always had it ready any time from 4.30 on, but you didn't sit down until Dad come home. <laughs> That's the way things were done then. And it is, and everybody's the same. If you were at your friend's house, and I just happened to think of this, or they were at your house, when it comes mealtime, you never got invited to sit down because they was fortunate to have enough to feed their own. You never invited them to sit down for the very same reason. <laughs> Mom had enough for who was eating there. And so you never hung around. When it come meal time, you just automatically went home. And, uh, and that was not unusual at all, but standard. And hobos were part of our history at that time. And uh, you always, they were very kind people. They were not anything other than needing a bite to eat. They never come in the house. They just be tickled to death for a slice of bread and maybe something that you could put on them. You had no meat to spare, so it might be just plain old butter or maybe a green onion that could go with it. But whatever you had available, it was totally appreciative and very thankful. But uh, no, no trouble with them. And that depression was a, and it impacted we who grow into adulthood because you had it ingrained with you from the time you was learning anything that you didn't have much. You better take care of what you had. And don't be greedy of somebody who might be just a little better than you, and uh, which wasn't too many of your own because it was all the same generation, the same age. But uh, it, it, it impacted what you were, that's for sure. And 
what else was we after there? Um, what big inventions came out when you when you were young? You know, probably the biggest one that I remember was TV, television, and that was black and white, and that was. We, did, we couldn't afford it. We just married. We could, but our, my wife's family was able to get one. He had a decent job, manager of the local elevator there, quite good. And, so, and his wife worked at a factory. So between the two of them, they had not a lot of money, but they had a lot more than we had. And we happened to live side by side, though, at that time. We were renting. And we, so whatever Friday night, I remember Friday nights because that was fights. Friday night at the fights. <laughs> So boy, we go over, we sit right into the old watch round, round picture, which is what the first screen was, and we plop down, boys welcome, and to watch the fights, and then we would go home because here's what happened to television then. There's two channel channels, channel 11 and channel 13 out of Toledo. That's all there was available, black and white. They both went off the air at 12 o'clock. <laughs> that was it. Nice lines would play. They show a logo, well, I forget what the logo looked like. But that'd be on for just a minute or two, and then the screen went just like the unplugged. You know? <laughs> so, but man, that was wonderful. A television set, wow. FM radio came into being about that time, too. And so that, I don't know, later on, plastic. Bottles were all like pop bottles. And beer bottles, they call we just called them beer bottles then. I guess they refer to them as long necks now if you can buy I, I don't know whether they buy them or not. But uh, they were recyclable. So it was not unusual for the young fellas to go out, walk up one side of the highway, and go back and walk the other side of the highway. But the idea, you're trying to find those long neck, we call that them, but the beer bottles, because they were two cents a piece, you could get two cents a piece for those. So you'd accumulate, try to get at least five, so you had ten cents, so you could go buy a candy bar and a bottle of pop, five cents each. Oh man, you had a system. <laughs> and, but you didn't have electrical carts or anything, you hoofed it out there and hoofed it back. And uh, strawberries alongside the railroad track they had wild strawberries were very good too. And they weren't poisoned or anything in those days, they were just there. So you knew where they were, so the strawberry season come around by. You had it out because mom could find some sugar to put in the strawberries. You ate dandelions too. Did your family ever eat dandelions? Mm -hmm. Green before the before the posy came out. When you get out Cut them out with a knife, kitchen knife, take them in the house, wash them good, wash them good. And they would sort of, oh, just not pan fried, uh, but sort of like that. They were sort of wilted. And that with a little vinegar, bread and butter, a pretty good meal. Well, again, potatoes. He ate a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Now, where are we now? Um. Oh, besides that, there's a. Uh, well, credit cards came into being along about then too. There's no such thing. You either paid cash if you or you ran an account at the grocery store if the owner, usually owner rather than managers then, that they knew you and if you had a steady payday, once a week you just got paid, why? Then they would run a little tab for you. And they had your name, a little scratch pad, like you take orders now. Well, that was, and they had the little trays that had you in there. So you usually shopped at the same place you sell them bought out of town. You usually stayed in town. Whiteville had at that time three grocery stores. <laughs> Can you imagine for that little community? And then there was many more. But we didn't go there. On Saturday night only, we would either come to North Baltimore or go to Dayshore. Why? Because North Baltimore had a theater, Dayshore had a theater. So did I, what else we did for entertainment was free shows during the week. 
come to your little community and the fellow would come and I remember this but sort of a station wagon type of vehicle and his camera was in the back race tailgate his camera was in the back he brought an oversized bed sheet along would string that up on a side street every place I mean same place every every week and people came because they knew that was free show night and so you would come and what would you sit? Well, some some people didn't have long chairs. There never such thing as a long chair then. So they would take the seats out of their vehicle, which is so easy to get out then. Or they would bring a blanket or something to sit on. Or if you're just a young kid, or you just plopped out wherever you wasn't in anybody's way, you know. <laughs> and then you would watch the free show. They would have a, a cereal. It would come on every week, and then there was always a, like soap operas are on television today, they leave you wanting for something else. Well, that's the way these theaters were. They let you wanting for something. You had to come back the next week. <laughs> you would anyhow, because that was a, really the social calendar for the week for you. So, and then that's when you tried to save your nickel or dime so that you could have a pop bar to watch the show. <laughs> but, but, it wasn't just you, uh, practically everybody your age was, did the same thing, and so it's, but uh, then plastic came into effect later on and could convert these glass bottles into plastic bottles, and, uh, and so it, uh, but as you heard me out at the memorial service, commercials were very tricky then, and Coke was the first bottle, a little six ounce bottle, about the same size they are now, but you can buy pop and cans now, you couldn't tell. It was all, and it was plastic then, it was all glass bottles. And you could recycle them too. I don't know if you got any money for those or not. I remember we really was anxious to find the empty beers on the side of the road, but we get two cents for them. <laughs> but uh, the, the everybody's pretty much the same. But next question. Um. Is it true that you were involved with the Boy Scouts? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was a scoutmaster for a good number of years. Mike Julian, he was one of my early scouts. And uh, uh, the present scoutmaster is much better scoutmaster than I was. Uh, he had much more vision in what was going on. You know, we got, uh, uh, got a number of up until Sean, why uh, our troop way back when had the most Eagle Scouts come out of it. And uh, we went to film out one. Well, I went out twice, but I took a troop of boys out once, made up of most of Troop 315. But in order to fill out the contingent, I had one boy from Rudolph, one boy from Hoytville, two boys from Bowling Green. Yeah, that was the, the troop we went out with. And we had, a, we had a meeting ahead of time, the leaders did, and they explained to us, rookies, we'd have an idea what to expect, what to pack, and what have you. So I come back with, the, got the troop together, and we did a rehearsal of what was needed. So we were, not the smartest troop out there, but we were better than dummy too, you know. And, they, and so when they put you on a trail, you had an opportunity at Philmont of selecting different trails. And the one we selected, well then they always sent a leader with you for the first couple of days to see how you, see if the old boy knows what he's doing. <laughs> you know? and so after the second day, well then he turned us loose because you work in a buddy system and you always, we always set up the campsite first, which was very basic, and which was a dining file up first. And then after that, you could set up your own tentage. So you never set up, you were first, the campsite was first. And uh, like I say, you used the buddy system, so you always had, look, two of you had to look after each other. That's what I mean by the buddy system. So. It's all part of the troop, which is also broken down into one-on-one. -on -one. 
And it worked out well. You did a lot of hiking all oh my. And even we'd exercised a couple times around here. But Philmont is in New Mexico, and it's in a mountain plain area out there. And there's only two ways to walk out there. You're either walking up or you're walking down. I don't remember too much flat out <laughs> there at all. And so you went out there feeling that you was pretty good condition. When you come home, you was <laughs> because of that up and down. And you walked every place every day. And you had this map that you was going by. And you had locations on the map that you were to show up to every evening. Some of them were attended camps where they had some of their cadre at those spots. More of them were just out in the open. And uh, so he was glad to get to attended camps because then you could sleep in tendage that was there. You didn't have to assemble your own. You still had to look after one another. And very, very good memories about that. But Mike, uh, uh, like I say, Mike Julian was one of my, he didn't go to film on, but uh, he was one of my better scout leaders, scouts here in town. Mike was one of those scouts that if you had a scout project, and he bought into it, you couldn't ask for a better scout. But if for some reason he didn't particularly like that project, you couldn't find him. <laughs> <laughs> he was still part of the troop, but he wasn't part of that project. <laughs> so uh, ahead of times <laughs> was it, uh, and Mike remembers that too. He's, he remembers fondly of the scouting here at Tom. Yeah, yeah, we were, we were busy, had a good time at it. So. That was a scouting time. Hmm. Um, how has the world grown and changed throughout your life? It has become so much more mechanical than it, what it used to be. Uh, repairing your bicycle, you did that. There was no three speed, five speed or anything. You just had to pedal bike one speed. The brake was put it back, no handlebar brakes. I mean, your brakes was on the pedal. You motivated with the pedal, you back, put a brake on with the pedal. And parts in those times, even for bicycles, and especially for automobiles, was difficult to come by. So it was not unusual to see one of your friends, or you, have your bike turned upside down to fix a flat tire. So you had the tools to get the tire off, and you took the tire off. In those days, they had inner tubes in the tire. So that's what you need to do. You patch the inner tube well, with, with a cold patch, which you could buy. And it was, you'd rub the hole in the tube, and stretch it out as best you could so you got a flat surface to work on. And then you put a little glue on that. <laughs> So it turned out a little bit. And then you peeled this little patch that you had. It had sticking stuff on one side, but it was covered with a piece of paper. So you tore the paper off, put that patch over that hole, and then you rubbed it. Made dog on sure it was there. And then how did you put air back in? Hand pumps. So it wasn't anything like air pumps in those days. No, you hand pump. So you'd pump it up just enough so you could get it back in the tire squeeze the tire back around, pump it back up, put it back on the line. And it's the same way with bearings. If the bearings would wear on the inner side or something of this nature, well, if you didn't have money to buy a bearing, you'd hope you could find some of Dad's grease, bulk grease, so that you could put heavy grease on that bearing so it would stick back in the place where it's supposed to be, you'd ram it up where it's supposed to be, and tighten it up. That helped pretty good. So you saved the bearings by using a lot of grease. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so as you took care of your bicycle, because you only had one, and it's usually a huge one, and you'd have a lot of bike races with one another. <laughs> one boy in time, I don't know where he got it, he had a bigger socket, you know, where the front end was, the, the, that front end spoke sprocket. He had a bigger size, of, you could not beat him. Because because of that exercise, he could he could 
wind up faster and get going further before you even think about getting going. So you never, you never challenge him to a race because it was a used suspension just unless you want to go for a ride. But that, uh, no, where are we at? I get rambling, I'm sorry. Um, we were talking about how the world has changed over the years, but we can move on to the next question if you're ready. Well, uh, it, the world, not physically, because of mile, 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 but the world has become smaller because of all the material, mechanical, modern things that we presently see that we're not done seeing yet, as they keep talking about robotic things. And we can see that in factories where it used to be hand labor, so much hand labor, physical labor, way back when of the canals that was built, the dams that was built, pretty much, and even the railroads were built pretty much by manual labor. So the physical manual labor part has de diminished quite a bit. There's still places where physical knowledge is necessary. Welders, for instance, can't get enough welders. You can always find a job welding. And there are other opportunities out there too that are past my knowledge but are available. But not near as many opportunities that there used to be. Uh, but, and it doesn't have to all be, I don't, I want to be careful on this because college education is extremely important but it's not mandatory. There's a lot of Again, I'm coming back to welding. You can learn welding. Uh, Owens up here is a good place to learn a number of beauticians, cooking, things still need to be done. And they need to be done by somebody with some degree of knowledge. And so you can still get a workable education in the workforce as well as the mental education in the college courses at a lot less cost. <laughs> a lot less cost. Because the young folks coming out of college now, unless they have decent parents that could afford this, and a lot of them can't, but they are need and willing to get the education, uh, as I did when I enlisted way back when, it was for the GI Bill of Rights as part of it. They, they can get these lesser cost opportunities. All they have to do is apply themselves. Current, news today will tell you that there's people looking, drive along the road, get out of town, hiring. You may not know what they're hiring, it may be a nominal amount of money, but I'm saying that the jobs are out there right today if you're really looking for labor. But that's up to you younger figures, people to figure out. I'm past that. My work of days are all, all behind me. What else do we want to talk about? What do you think North Baltimore will be like in 20 years? You know, I thought about that too. I, I really think with the condition of the growth around, that I look for us to be, in my opinion, I look for us to be about the same in 20 years, only larger. In other words, I look for the same community concept as we have now, because all these people that's going to school now don't have to get out of town. They can find jobs around here. Startup jobs, I'm not saying career jobs, but it helps build up your resume when you go to, if you decide to go someplace else, but even go someplace else doesn't necessarily mean that you're not within the driving distance anymore. A number of our people still work in Lima, Fostoria, uh, Bowling Green, Toledo, Maumee, so, and that's no driving distance anymore. When we were a kid, that was a major trip if you went to Toledo. <laughs> and if you had family in Cleveland, which we did for a short period of time, man, that was a day long trip. And you usually tried to stay over and come back the next day because the vehicles, they weren't speed merchants. And if you, my first car was a Model A Ford, and the best I could get that thing up to was 45 miles an hour. My good friend, another friend, had a Model A Ford. He could get 60 out of his. 
So whenever we went out of town, we took his. <laughs> but that, I'm just saying, speed was not a big thing. One of the comments was, boy, he looks like he's going 60. Because that was like, like now you say, it looks like you're going 100, you know? <laughs> and, but that, just silly memories that come back to you. But that's where you come from, is memories. And uh, now where are we at? I, I look for the town to still be here. It's a shame, very much so, that Hammondsburg used to be a Luthari removal community. Now it's a bedroom community. And White Hill is, once the school went to Macomb system, now the post office is a part-time post office. And there's no business places over there at all. And Macomb, with the furniture going out of there, there, pretty much a bedroom community too, although they have water and sewer. Bairdstown, Galatea, Boondale, these smaller communities unless they have something to keep it going. And we have our small factories here in town. And prior to that we had small factories in Norfolk. And then the tomato plant that was out here for so many years. And so no, it's in, it's it's an active community and we who were active in the community have have been fortunate to see those things that we did. People have taken over scouting, for instance, church, for instance, school board. Yeah, I was on school board for local school board, county school board, and penis school board. All school boards, all different perspective on what they were supposed to do. Very interesting, but you can see that education has always been important to North Palm, or still is, and that's wonderful. And to see that the interest and the desire and the capabilities of what we're able to do it used to be. Our superintendents for superintendents coming to North Baltimore was like a finishing school for them before they went on to higher paying jobs. And that was understood. You knew that you knew you was going to get a good one, but you knew you weren't going to get a keeping. <laughs> and so so that that worked out for and possibly still does, although it seems like the current administration has been here several years now. And so Maybe they decide this is high enough, and it is. I mean, the pay that our administration and the courts and what have you, including the village people, are well, decent paying jobs now, in which they can move to the community if they so desire and, and make a decent living and a decent home, which enhances your longevity in the community if they so choose. Again, rambling. You just asking my thoughts. <laughs> Those are. So, where else are we at? Uh, what are your hopes for the future? I thought a little bit about that, and with the world, I, I you hear this, but it, it has so much meaning to me. I hope we can live in peace. I'm not talking about just us. I'm talking about the world can find reasons to get along. So we may look different, we may be built different, but we're all the same, <laughs> we really are. And uh, the good Lord made us that way when he formed us out of dust way back when. And so it's really up. And along with the peace, I would hope there'd be prosperity so you could have decent living. I wouldn't I wouldn't wish depression <laughs> from personal experience. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. You get through it, sure you get through it. But it'd be nicer to not necessarily have a bigger car than your neighbor's got, but at least have a vehicle to get around in. And so it and I would hope that the people would realize and appreciate what they personally had and not looking to be one up someone, somebody else in town. I suppose that's natural, but it'd be nice if it weren't 
<laughs> the natural thing. But then if, if you're comfortable in your own skin and your own environment, then you can be pretty nice. We had one minister a number of years ago. He always liked to put out one little thing, you know. And one of them was, he said, you know, you can always be nice to somebody one day, and that's all about. So in other words, be nice one day, you know. But sometimes our mom and pops, we couldn't do that. We had to pick on them, didn't we? Have, you know. So I, I think, is that about enough? Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you for coming. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah.